My talk today, uh, as you can see here, is titled Using New Media Assignments to Reach Beyond the Classroom. Uh, so who, who in here, I'm assuming it's everybody, I just want to make sure, who in here has ever taught a psychology class? There we go, okay, good. Right. Be a little awkward if you weren't. You know, or who's, if you're not, are you planning on teaching more in the future? There you go, right. Um, so everybody here has taught, is actively teaching right now, plans on teaching, at the very least has been in a classroom. Right? <laughs> um, so I, probably like most of you who have taught, uh, was once a young, fresh-faced, I know it's hard to believe now, but was once young and fresh-faced professor, uh, and I was raring to go. I was at my classroom, I'm making assignments, I'm getting syllabi ready, I'm just excited, uh, you know, unlike now, where I'm just kind of dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be more excited and things like that. Uh, but, you know, what did I do when I was sort of, you know, fresh into this? Well, I did a lot of what I would just call aping, right? So I took what my professors had done with me, uh, wonderful professors, including people like Dr. Thomas back there, uh, and Dr. Kennison, and did the same sort of things. Um, sort of what I would call, or what I'll find now, is kind of traditional assignments, right? So we've got, we've got a test, we've got a paper, maybe some sort of group project that everybody loves, Right? Yeah. Especially, those, especially those high achievers, they love those group projects. So. Um, and I just, I was doing that. And I rolled along for a couple of years doing that, getting good reviews, students seemed to be doing fine, seemed to be reaching learning objectives and whatnot. Uh, and then I kind of shook my head one day and I realized that I was very, very tired of grading papers. Um, and. It wasn't that I was tired of grading papers because I was lazy. I consider myself to be fairly hardworking. Uh, I was tired of grading papers because it felt like, what's the point? Uh, and again, not in some sort of existential crisis way. Uh, you know, I wasn't in the office just pounding my head on the desk or anything. But it was more of a, there's so much effort being put by these students into these things that they're doing for their class assignments, particularly into the semester assignments. And I'm the only one who sees this. There's so much that they're doing. There's so much effort put in here, hours and hours and hours put in here. And for who? Just for me? Like, I, I mean, I'm an appreciative audience, but like, do I really deserve those hundreds and hundreds of worth of hours of work just to be for me alone? Like, maybe not. Maybe there's something else we can do. Maybe there's something that we could, you know, somehow take all this effort, all this work, and we can make it not just accessible to a single person. Because what I started realizing was that a typical class paper uh, had a, a very distinct life cycle. Uh, and again, we've all written papers. Writing papers is a very needed skill that needs to be taught. Uh, but at the same time, there is a typical life to it. Uh, and it starts like this, right, where the student is writing the paper. Um, Often they're very engaged in the work that they're doing, perhaps. Um, the professor then <laughs> reads the paper, um, reads you know, the work the students have worked so hard on, often having to do so you know, while swigging coffee at 3 a.m. on a Monday morning because the grades are due Tuesday at you know, noon or something like that, right? Um, and, and then no one cares, right? <laughs> like, literally no one cares. You know, I give you the grade, you're like, oh, they've got to pass. And then no one cares. Like, what happens next? <laughs> Where does that paper go? It goes nowhere, right? 99% of these papers go nowhere. They do nothing. They have certainly benefited the student. You know, fingers crossed, right? They've benefited the student. The student has learned from them. But what else? You know, what else would then happen? So I started searching. And I started looking around. I started in the action in the fall of 2008 two years after starting being a full-time professor. Uh, I started kind of searching for, you know, what, what else is out there? Like, what else could we potentially do? You know, what options are there? Things that I could do in the classroom with my students that might not just benefit them and me, because, you know, it keeps me in a job, but might benefit other people as well. How can we expand the circle 
of people that benefit from what these students are doing, what they're learning, how things are going in the classroom. And so what I decided to do after a bit of looking was I decided to try some what we would call new media assignments. New media, as you can see there, is just a broad term for some sort of means of mass communication via the internet. And this encompasses huge numbers of different things. Any website, for example, technically would count as new media. Uh, social media, things like Twitter and whatnot, they count as new media. Uh, but there are also some others that maybe are a little better for an academic setting as well. We'll see those. So I started looking at, okay, what can we do here? Um, I consider myself very technologically savvy. Uh, you know, I've owned a computer most of my life. Uh, we started with dual drive boots and five and a quarter floppies. Um, some of you are like, none of those words make sense. Um, and that's fine because I'm old. Uh, but we started with that. You know, I've had a website uh, since 97, uh, so I consider myself fairly savvy. But here's the interesting thing, is that even though this is the digital generation, most of them that's going through college, most of them don't know jack squat about what happens on their little digital devices. Um, most of them have very low levels of technology savvy, as opposed to just being able to use it. Uh, so I knew that we had to start with something that, like, uh, I can teach them how to do it and not have to spend a lot of class time on it, be fairly useful. So the first thing that we did was we started taking some baby steps towards this new media in terms of taking these kind of typical class papers that you would write and then combining those with a wiki platform. Now most people when you say wiki they think of wiki spaces, right, which is this online encyclopedia. What does a wiki do? Well, a wiki allows anyone to edit information that's online, contribute to that to increase the knowledge store uh, that's available on a particular topic. So Wikipedia is a general encyclopedia, but there's also things, my personal favorite, Wikipedia, which is all about Star Wars. Um, there's also things like Conservapedia and Skeptopedia and all these other different things. Um, and they're all you know, accessible online and built by just people. They're not necessarily experts in the area. So I thought, well, what if we combine that, those two things together? Right? What if we took the work that you might do with a traditional class paper, and instead we just do it online? Uh, and then everybody could maybe benefit from that. Now, the first thing that I did with this was in my abnormal psychology class. Uh, I know a couple of you have heard me talk a little bit about this before, uh, but we built, over the course of three years, and about 300 students, uh, using a technique that I call Darwickianism, uh, we <laughs> built a pretty reasonable undergraduate textbook, about 800 printed pages uh, that was used at three universities. It's all DSM-4 stuff, so now people are like, there's a fire, it's amazing. So, except those of us who are clinicians are like, no, it actually sucks. Um, <laughs> but we haven't updated it yet. Uh, so, but, I mean, we had, Free textbook, it's completely free, completely free online, built by students. Um, and, you know, it looks a little dated because we haven't updated it in about four or five years now. But if it'll load, I'll show it to you right quick. Um, so, it's just at abnormalpsych.wikispaces.com. And all this stuff's linked from my website if you guys want to go there. Uh, but we have tons of information. Uh, I want to learn about the anxiety disorders. Okay, here's the anxiety disorders. Right? Let's look at OCD. That's my particular specialty. And you can see that we have pretty much what you would see in any sort of college level textbook about that. And this was built, again, primarily by students. Now, as we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, this took a lot of effort on my part. Right? It wasn't just like, go! Create, build, be amazing, because that would not work, it turns out. Uh, so it took a lot of effort up front, but we do have some pretty excellent results here. Um, so in the past eight years since we started this, um, there have been close to one million views uh, of this website. Again, used at three different universities as a primary or supplementary 
text, um, and it's student created. So is that useful then? Students learned, um, students learned a lot. I'll talk specifically about kind of how I assign things for them in a little bit. But the students definitely learned a lot, uh, objectively in terms of measures on things like their exams, they did just as well as when I had more lengthy traditional final papers. Even though the writing was usually shorter, uh, overall it still took more effort because it turns out when you tell someone that, hey, hundreds of thousands of people are going to see your work, they go, maybe I better not slack as much on this. <laughs> as opposed to, teacher's going to be, uh, let's face it, semi-psychotic during final week, <laughs> so I can probably get away with something. Um, so that was our first kind of entry into that. Um, we next then built a graduate level textbook uh, for a class, a seminar that I had at the time that was about science versus pseudoscience. Uh, it's not quite as big, you know, it's only like maybe 350 pages. Uh, uh, and it's got, you know, several hundred thousand views again over the last four or five years. So that was, that was to me, that was pretty exciting. Um, we did things like look at all the diagnostics, um, the different diagnostic categories. We had case studies of individual characters that we did where students would be assigned a disorder and they would have to find a fictional character that would qualify for that disorder. Uh, for example, for dysthymia or chronic depression, someone chose Eeyore, um, which was great. Uh, another person the next semester actually for generalized anxiety uh, chose Piglet. Uh, we had people like Bart Simpson for ADHD and things like that. Um, and they built these lovely little, you know, sort of case histories, uh, examples, so that people could learn about these disorders. So this went on for, again, about three years uh, that we did the abnormal psych textbook. And we sort of got to, to where it was, it was done. It was like, oh, well, what do we do now? Crap, I've got to come up with another idea. I was really going along well. Okay, here we go. What, what next? So I started looking at, okay, what other avenues of communication are out there that we can work with? Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this website before, but there's this <laughs> video website called YouTube. Um, and YouTube is, it turns out, ridiculous. Every minute, every minute of every hour, there's about 300 hours of video uploaded onto YouTube. Uh, you know, half of that is just like video game long plays, but uh, that's what my son watches. Uh, uh, viewed, we have like 3.25 billion hours of video watched per month on YouTube. This is the number one search engine for millennials. When millennials want information, they go to YouTube. They don't go to Google like this old guy does. Uh, they don't go to Bing like, you know, Bill Gates does. Um, they go to YouTube. That's what they do. Uh, this is the third most visited site in the world. It's localized uh, in languages across about 55 different countries and see these things worldwide. So I thought, well, let's try that. Let's try, let's try making videos. Nothing could go wrong there, right? <laughs> these students are technologically savvy. <laughs> they probably learned how to do these things as a high schooler, right? Turns out, no. Um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But nonetheless, we persevered, soldiered through, and as of now, we actually have three distinct uh, video series on YouTube. Uh, one is a case study in abnormal psychology, and this was fun because you basically, uh, the students got to take and adapt work that other students had already done into a video form. So someone had written up a case presentation of uh, Bart Simpson having ADHD, and then three other students came along and were able to take that case presentation and work and turn it into a video and be able to turn that into a video. So it's not just that they're having to completely start over, it's that they're building on things that are already existing. These then get integrated back into that online textbook. So that you have a text and then you have literally like a 10 to 15 minute video that tells you all about that disorder. Uh, so that whatever your preferred style of learning is, you can sort of get that there. Uh, we have a series on pseudoscience in Oklahoma that came out of my science versus pseudoscience class where there's documentaries on things like uh, the Oklahoma octopus, which is a supposed cryptid 
that lives in Lake Thunderbird. <laughs> and if you talk to people who believe in it, they tell you about how it's been there for thousands of years, which is fantastic because the lake is only about 70 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Things like uh, the Sasquatch Festival, the Sasquatch hunting down in Hanobi, uh, or how John Wilkes Booth died in Enid, Oklahoma in the early 1900s rather than being killed uh, you know, when he actually was. <laughs> and so, some, again, some very localized things here. Uh, people are learning. Uh, they're learning new skills. Because, again, most people don't just like, oh, yeah, well, I've made dozens of videos before. They're all of my cat, right? Uh, or of me singing, uh, but terribly, mind you. Uh, but I've made them, right? No, people are learning new skills. Uh, and it turns out when you put these things online, you get results. Um, over the last five-ish years or so, these student-made videos have had about 1.5 million views, uh, over four, almost 4.1 million uh, minutes watched of these student videos. Like that's, that's a fairly large impact. Um, when we look at, when we look at uh, geographic reach, the majority of these views come from the United States, but it's a bare majority. It's only about 54% meaning that 46% of these 1.5 million views are from outside the United States. Uh, a very large number of those come from developing countries. Uh, we're big in Brazil. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but we have about 10% of our views come from Brazil. Uh, India, we have over 220 countries that have viewed these student-created works. Most of them, again, you know, not necessarily folks at my university. Like, I'm not just sitting there with the playlist all day and like, <laughs> muting it and be like, yeah, I'm racking up those views. Uh, <laughs> these are people who are actually seeing, using, learning these things. Uh, so when we started rolling on those, I started looking for others, kind of smaller things. Uh, and blogs are a thing. I don't know if you guys have heard of blogs. Uh, that's a thing, short for weblog. No one ever calls it a weblog because that's dumb. They just call them blogs, right? These are short things that you put up online. Uh, most of these are about you know, again people's cats or uh, you know hobbies and things like that. Uh, so what we did was we started putting up blogs about scientific psychology uh, and about science and pseudoscience, uh, and started again trying to sort of increase that store of information that's out there in the world that's accurate, scientific, and well done. Because it turns out there's lots of the other stuff. I don't know if you guys have been on, on the internet lately. Uh, huge, huge swaths of the internet should just be burned down. Uh, they're, just, they're just terrible. Uh, they're poorly written, they're completely factually wrong. Lots and lots of things there. Uh, so we started having students do blogs. Uh, now, like those talk about again here in a second uh, there's a lot of pre <laughs> pre work done for these things uh, but it turns out again pretty well over the last four years they've published students have published about 175 blogs uh, specific blog articles and they've had about half a million views in that time uh, which is pretty good what this shows is the views for me this is the only way I can get them I'm not trying to be braggy uh, the views for me versus the other people on my uh, salon that I Right on, which is called the Skeptic Inc. Network. Uh, and most of the stuff that's on there is students. Uh, and they're really doing very well. Uh, so the reason I started with all this kind of like, oh, here, look at how many people have done this. It's not because I'm trying to be braggy, not because I'm just up here just like, look at me, I'm amazing. Right? Uh, it was to kind of sort of get you excited about the fact that hey, students can do things that can actually be useful to the world. I know sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Maybe you like you're teaching general psychology, um, and then you, you look at the quality of the work sometimes and you just weep for humanity. <laughs> um, but it turns out if you push them and you guide them and you give structure, they can actually turn out some really good stuff. Now, again, I mentioned a term earlier that was called Darwickianism. Uh, how wikis work, in case you don't know, is you edit it, all right, you write something, somebody else comes and they're like, that's crap, 
and then they fix things and somebody else comes like, no, that's wrong, and then they fix it some more and change it some more. And that's very much the process that we had to do with our online books. Because when you have an undergraduate write part of a textbook, you can expect that it's probably not gonna be the world's greatest thing. But if I have three or six generations of students going in, revising, adapting, changing, adding, all of a sudden you start seeing this nice leveling out of information. Because you have people who are fantastic and they're great wordsmiths, or they know grammar like nobody's business, or they can really cite articles really well. And then you have people who are just like, ah, how, how does this work? Do I just yell at it? Right? <laughs> like they think it's Star Trek or something. Um, so it takes a while, certainly that process takes a while, um, but it can be done and it can work and it's really cool. Um, and again, I'm not trying to say like, I'm, I'm amazing, I'm bragging on myself, I'm bragging on my students because they're the ones who actually put all this work in. Um, not that I didn't have to work and I probably actually worked more on these projects, grading them, setting them up than I did on traditional projects. But there's an end result that's out there for everybody, which to me is pretty cool. So I say all that to, again, kind of get you pumped up and be like, this is kind of exciting. Like, we can, we can, we can do things. Now, I'm not saying, again, no one needs to learn how to write a paper. No, that's a needed skill. And that's a skill that underlies most of the stuff that happens up here. Um, but what I'm saying is, there are other skills that we can teach that can help us learn the same kinds of information, get our students excited about the material, get them excited about what they're doing. That doesn't just have to be a traditional assignment. So that being said, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the nitty gritty of this and kind of how you actually make this sort of thing happen. Uh, because I can come up here and be like, oh, look at these views, and look at that. And you're like, that's amazing. And then you go back and you're like, I don't know what that is. Like, I don't know what, what are those words again? So let's talk a little bit about kind of the nitty gritty or how you have to get into doing it. So I call these my tips for branching out, right? Because you're branching out from these traditional assignments. We all know how to grade a Scantron, right? We all know how to uh, grade a paper. But what do you do with this other stuff? Like, how do you grade a video, for example? Um, my first tip is that you really, really have to plan carefully and think these things out beforehand. You can't just like a week before <laughs> the semester starts be like, you know what? Things are going to be different. Things are going to be different this semester, but it's going to be amazing. <laughs> and then you walk in there and you're like, we're changing things. And they're like, yay! And then like six weeks later, you're going, I'm so lost and I'm just crying in my office and things like that. The students are crying in their rooms. No, like you got to carefully plan this stuff out. So, um, and this is a thing that I learned. I'll be honest, through trial and error. Like my first, my first semester of trying these new assignments. At the end of the semester, I was just like, oh, I hate myself. This is a terrible idea. Why did I do this to myself? Um, and no, I have to learn from this. Here's what we'll do next time. Uh, so I'm trying to save you all that first step uh, and the you know several hundred dollars you would spend on whiskey or something. Uh, so, plan carefully. All right, the first thing that I would say is you have to know how to do whatever it is you're asking your students to do. Just like you can't grade a paper if you don't know how to write a paper, you have to know how to do these things. You have to know, like I had to learn, how do I build a wiki, I had to research different platforms, I had to make sure that the platforms that I was using uh, allowed me to track contributions and track changes over time and easily go in there and see those. Uh, I had to be able to have something that was easy enough for my students to learn, that I could give them detailed instructions, spend some time in class, and then give them a lot of resources. But I didn't spend you know three weeks in class teaching them how to make a wiki. I spent about a probably a, a full class period, an hour, hour and a half or so, going over, here's how you log in, here's the instructions, here's what you do, da 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 da. We started making videos. I mean, I'm not some amazing video maker who's running around cutting videos. Uh, I am now. <laughs> but I wasn't then. <laughs> I was not in any way then. I was just like, all right, I'll use a, a camera. 
uh, and we'll use some sort of computator to cut this. Um, so I had to teach myself how to use some of the more common, easily available editing software out there, things like Windows Movie Maker at the time, uh, Apple's iMovie. Uh, I had to learn how to import, export, add video, I had to learn about storyboarding. Uh, I had to learn a whole bunch of stuff before I could then say, okay students, here's what I want you to do. Because you might not know just how much effort that sort of thing takes, because it takes a lot of effort, it turns out. Um, so you have to make sure that you know what to do. For the blog, I started blogging about a year before I let my students start trying uh, I built up an audience, I got a style down, I got where I felt comfortable with what the length would be, uh, the kind of language that we would be using. Because another thing with some of these projects, the blogs in particular, is that you're not necessarily writing for an academic audience. Our blogs are for a lay audience. There's somebody who goes on to Google and types in, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, sleep disorders. And then one of these blogs might come up, and then they'll be able to read it and understand it, as opposed to clicking on it and being like, oh boy, I don't know none of that. And then going back and then learning how it's all a result of I don't know, some medicine deficiency that you need to buy from a particular supplement seller or something like that. Um, so it's learning how to communicate to different audiences in different mediums, and you have to be able to kind of do that first. So that's my first thing, know how to do before you assign. Um, second, very detailed instructions. So um, for our, let's give you an example. For the, documentaries that we started making, um, we actually made, this is part of what helps me learn how to do this, We actually made a series of videos, a seven video series. Uh, no, I don't like that ad. Um, we made a seven video series about how to make a documentary. That goes from everything from how to storyboard to how to shoot, uh, how to import things, basic editing, work with audio, advanced editing, exporting. And then it was just like, here, <clears throat> children, here it is. All you gotta do is watch this, it'll take you through the whole process. Um, for the wikis, very detailed instructions that uh, Wikispace has had. I had supplementary instructions on there. Uh, for the blogs, they had tons of examples and I can have very detailed instructions. Here's how long, here's the kind of wording, here's what to do, here's what not to do. Um, and going over things in class. Again, not taking huge amounts of time, but taking enough time to help them out with specific, most common questions. Um, also, you may, you may make sure they have access to resources. Our university is wonderful in that we have this technology resource center where students can get tripods, lights, cameras. Uh, they can go in there and get help with their video editing. Uh, they can have access to microphones. Lots of great resources there. So I made sure they knew how to access that and I made sure that I warned our technology people, hey, they're going to be coming. Uh, there's a herd of them on the way, sort of thing. Um, one of the other things that I learned pretty quickly was that you need to make sure and have lots of very small deadlines throughout the semester. Most of us, when we have a final project, it's just, it's due at the end of the semester. That's it. Um, you can't do that with these sort of assignments because these are very different from what students have done previously. So for our documentaries, for example, we had a storyboarding deadline. We had a first draft deadline. We had a second draft deadline. And I would give them feedback along each stage of this. Um, same thing with the wikis. They had to have a certain amount contributed each uh, three weeks. They had to have X number of words that were contributed to that, or X number of edits that were made. So lots and lots of these small deadlines. That helps overcome, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this term or not, procrastination, uh, which we see occasionally in our student population. Not, none of these students here, I'm sure, uh, but some students out there have that. Uh, and finally, uh, and to plan carefully, 
plan to actually have people coming into your office hours because they're going to be very nervous and worried. And when you first talk about it in the first class period and go to the syllabus, you're like, hey, we're going to be making a video. And you just watch the little faces go. <laughs> What's this? I was all ready to write a paper. I don't know what this video nonsense is, but I don't like it because it's different. Uh, even your very high achievers, high strivers, you know, they're saying things like, I know how to do this. Why don't we change? Right? No, I got that. I can get an A on this. I know. What's this nonsense? Um, so lots of trepidation, lots of questions from students, uh, and just make yourself available. Uh, I was lucky enough to get a small grant, and I was able to get uh, a whole, a second computer in my office uh, that was just for video editing just for working with media. Uh, and so the students could come in there, we could work one-on-one -on -one in my office with the things that they were having problems with. Um, then there's grades. How do you grade a video somebody made? Thoughtfully, carefully, using a well thought out rubric. Uh, because these rubrics, you know, they tell us, you got this many points for this, you got this many points for that. They also, though, tell the students, this is what I'm looking for. I give my rubrics to students ahead of time. Here's the things that you need to make sure that you do in your blogs, in your videos, whatever it happens to be. Because if they don't have that, they don't know. Right? They don't know what's expected. Um, and so this is, again, part of that sort of pre-planning, especially when you're doing something like this that's not something most of them have ever done before. Um, they need a little more guidance, a little more structure. Uh, you put your scaffolding up, uh, and then they're able to do much better there. Now, this isn't, again, this isn't hand-holding. This is just saying, here's the resources. Here's what I expect. If you need help, I'm here. Let me help you if you need it. And not just, you know, again, holding your hand or anything. Uh, one of the other things is grading for effort, not necessarily just for final product, uh, because some of these will be terrible, even if they spent a very long time working on it and they did a really you know, good job working hard, some of them will still end up with something that you don't put online. Uh, and not necessarily because they did it wrong, but just because you know, maybe they shot everything crooked or uh, because their voice, you know, uh, didn't sound very good in the microphone, or maybe they did rush it, and then you can actually take off for that stuff. But, you know, we're not all Steven Spielberg. Some of the stuff that students have produced for me has been amazing. Like, it's, it's one of my students made a 45-minute doc, documentary that looks like something you would see, like, on the History Channel, right? Uh, and it was amazing. And then students come in with 15-minute documentaries, and you're like, you spent approximately six minutes making this, didn't you? Uh, like, how does that even work? I don't know, but like, did you shoot it all like super fast? I don't understand. Um, so you'll see a wide variety, just like you will with any assignment, though, right? I mean, how many of you get all A papers when you give papers? No, nobody. I never have. Um, so you still see that sort of normal curve showing up in terms of who's doing what and how it's going. But make sure that you're not, this isn't just like a yes, no, right, wrong sort of grading. That's why you need to have a very careful rubric planned out. And then finally, I would say be prepared for some pushback. Uh, I received a fairly high amount of pushback, uh, both from students and from other faculty, actually. Uh, well, uh, how are you going to assess their learning objective without a paper? Like this? Well, but I don't understand. Well, that's fine. You don't have to understand. I can still do an assessment, you know, for my course, and it can still go fine. Uh, but you will potentially get some of that pushback. Mm -hmm. I heard they're writing blogs. What sort of nonsense is that? Mm -hmm. We're teaching them how to be scientists. Well, you know what scientists are really terrible at? Communicating to the public. <laughs> you know what they need a hell of a lot more experience doing? Communicating to the public. Uh, because that allows us to actually interact with the people that we're trying to help with our either basic or applied research. 
And so that's a skill that's often neglected, and that's one that can be really, really highly um, sort of honed through assignments like this. Because you can know all there is to know about a particular area of study and not be able to tell your grandmother about it. But if I have to take something that's fairly complex, distill that down into a 10 minute video or a thousand word blog, next thing I know, people are actually like, oh, well, I got I get that. How about that? And then you start seeing again these kind of changes. Now the goal of these assignments is the same as it is for anything else, right? It's to help students learn material. But what we're doing here is helping them learn material and often new skills, new skill sets that they can take. Um, I've had a number of students come back to me. They've graduated, they've gone a few years, they find me on Facebook, they come to the office, and they talk about, well, uh, since I actually had done this, now I'm in charge of this sort of thing at my work because no one else had any experience with it. It's like, oh, that's awesome, right? Like, that's a skill you can now put onto a resume, uh, a CV. You have work that you can show online and say, like, oh, no, I did this. Uh, as opposed to, I brought in a stack of papers that I wrote. Would you like to read it? You're going to be like, no, I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> But, oh, hey, there's a video, here's a blog, oh, well, I'll take a look at that. So the goal is to help students learn, help them learn new skills, but at the same time, these kinds of assignments, what they do is they help contribute to the world store of good psychological information. They allow us to make a contribution that's gonna be seen a lot more. I publish a fairly large amount. I publish a number of books. I guarantee you, none of my books has had 900,000 views. <laughs> Even as wonderful as they are, <laughs> nowhere near that, right? Nowhere near that. People see this information. How many of you right now have a web-enabled device on your person or within reach? Right. How many of you have uh, a textbook on your person right now? All right, a couple people. <laughs> Be proud. Don't, don't hide it. That's awesome. Uh, but you know, this makes this information easily accessible and takes it out of the realm of just the academy, throws it out there to the world. But be ready to work actually harder <laughs> than you did in some of your other class assignments, especially up front. Um, but you will be able to reap the benefits and the rewards there. So.